point, it's page 670. So it's near the start of Ecclesiastes, we did um, verses 1 to 11 last week, so I'm going to start to read at verse 12 of chapter 1. I, the teacher, was king of Israel in Jerusalem. I devoted myself to study and to explore by wisdom all that is done under heaven. What a heavy burden God has laid on men. I've seen all the things that are done under the sun. All of them are meaningless, a chasing after the wind. What is twisted cannot be straightened. What is lacking cannot be counted. I thought to myself, look, I've grown and increased in wisdom more than anyone who's ruled over Jerusalem before me. I've experienced much of wisdom and knowledge. Then I applied myself to the understanding of wisdom and also of madness and folly. But I learned that this, too, is a chasing after the wind. For with much wisdom comes much sorrow. The more knowledge, the more grief. I thought in my heart, come now, I will test you with pleasure to find out what is good. But that also proved to be meaningless. Laughter, I said, is foolish. And what does pleasure accomplish? <clears throat> I tried cheering myself with wine and embracing folly, my mind still guiding me with, with wisdom. I wanted to see what was worthwhile for men to do under heaven during a few days of their lives. I undertook great projects. I built houses for myself and planted vineyards. I made gardens and parks and planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made reservoirs to water groves of flourishing trees. I bought male and female slaves and had other slaves who were born in my house. I also owned more herds and flocks than anyone in Jerusalem before me. I amassed silver and gold for myself and the treasure of kings and provinces. I acquired men and women singers and a harem as well, the delights of the heart of man. I became greater by far than anyone in Jerusalem before me. In all this, my wisdom stayed with me. I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all my work, and this was the reward for my labor. Yet, when I surveyed all that my hands had done, what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless, a chasing after the wind, nothing was gained under the sun. Then I turned my thoughts to consider wisdom and also madness and folly. What more can the king's successor do than what has already been done? I saw that wisdom is better than folly, just as light is better than darkness. The wise man has eyes in his head while the fool walks in the darkness. But I came to realise that the same fate overtakes them both. Then I thought in my heart, the fate of the fool will overtake me also. What then do I gain by being wise? I said in my heart, this too is meaningless. For the wise man, like the fool, will not be long remembered. In days to come, both will be forgotten. Like the <coughs> fool, the wise man too must die. So I hated life. Because the work that is done under the sun was grievous to me. All of it is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. I hated all the things I had toiled for under the sun because I must leave them to the one who comes after me. And who knows whether he will be a wise man or a fool. Yet he will have control over all the work into which I have poured my effort and skill under the sun. This too is meaningless. So my heart began to despair over all my toilsome labor under the sun. For a man may do his work with wisdom, knowledge and skill, and then he must leave all he owns to someone who has not worked for it. This too is meaningless and a great misfortune. What does a man get for all the toil and anxious striving with which he labours under the sun? All his days, his work is paid in grief. Even at night, his mind does not rest. This too is meaningless. A man can do nothing better than to eat and drink and find satisfaction in his work. This, too, I see, is from the hand of God. 
For without him, who can eat or find enjoyment? To the man who pleases him, God gives wisdom, knowledge, and happiness. But to the sinner, he gives the task of gathering and storing up wealth to hand it over to the one who pleases God. This too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Thanks, Martin. We're back. Are we back? Have I broken it? Again? Better? One, two? Yes. Yeah. Okay, yes. good. You were all very, very excited there, I can tell. <laughs> yes, no, um, it's uh, nice to see you all. Uh, we're into our second week looking through Ecclesiastes, uh, a book that I think relates to real life more than perhaps any other in just terms of being practical. Uh, so uh, let's pray before we begin, because we may need God's help to think it through. I'm also going to pray for Liliana, uh, Lee's wife. Uh, her mum died. I, I don't know if it was uh, very recently, so they did come, but she's left because she's uh, obviously finding that hard. So let me pray for her as well uh, as we begin. Uh, Heavenly Father, we uh, pray for Liliana and her family. Um, we thank you for the life of her mother. And uh, we pray now that as they mourn and they grieve, uh, that you would be with them. We pray that you would be uh, their comfort and their rock. May they turn to you uh, for all they need at this time. And may you give them hope. We also pray for us as we consider this passage, which itself thinks about death, uh, realities of life. We pray that you would speak to us by your spirit, through your word, for your glory and for our good. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, when the uh, great philosopher, uh, Homer Simpson, uh, got to know his massively wealthy boss, uh, Mr. Burns, uh, he, he observed, you're the richest man I know. Uh, Mr. Burns replied, I can't do an impression. Uh, yes, but I'll trade it all for more. Yes, but I'll trade it all for more. Uh, it's true, isn't it, in so many ways. Uh, we live uh, with a constant dissatisfaction. If only I had more. Uh, more wisdom, more money, more fun, more pleasure, more of a relationship, more. Uh, it's a mantra of our world. It's why we go exploring and uh, on holidays and traveling and, uh, and seek promote. If only I had a bit more. But sadly, says Ecclesiastes, uh, more is as dissatisfying as less. Uh, as we observed from our summary introduction of Ecclesiastes uh, two weeks ago now, uh, chapter one, verse two, meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher, utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. Uh, we find it hard, don't we? And I think our world would find it hard to, to basically disagree with that. It, it is meaningless. What's the point of it all? And this book, Ecclesiastes, is like a search for the meaning of life. What's it all about? How do I have any real meaning or gain in this life? Or is there none available? Maybe that's the end of the story. Uh, well, that's a little bit of the journey we're going on today. And our teacher, the author of this book, investigates uh, roughly four kind of key areas of life to investigate where is the meaning in this? Is this where I'm going to find gain in this life? Uh, the first one he investigates is this idea of wisdom or knowledge. Uh, it's verses 12 to 18. Have a look uh, at verse 16. Uh, he says this. I said to myself, look. I have increased in wisdom more than anyone who ruled over Jerusalem before me. I have experienced much of wisdom and knowledge. Then I applied myself to the understanding of wisdom and also uh, of madness and folly. But I learned that this too is a chasing after the wind. In other words, he's using his impressive wisdom to see if pursuing more wisdom and knowledge will find joy or satisfaction or meaning in this life. Uh, meaningless, the word 
uh, it carries this idea of breath, that chasing after the wind idea. Uh, it, it's temporary or, or fleeting. It, it doesn't achieve anything for us. But why is uh, wisdom and knowledge meaningless? Uh, sh surely that is what uh, most of our world pursues all the time. It is what we think as well. Uh, knowledge, data, algorithms to predict human behavior. All the, these are the currencies of our day. Surely there's meaning in wisdom and knowledge. Well, verse 18, for with much wisdom comes much sorrow. The more knowledge, the more grief. In other words, the more we think about life, the more we understand about things, the more depressing it comes. It doesn't mean that in itself is bad, but there is no lasting gain or meaning in it. The more you know about something, the more you know about its problems as well. Or the more at least that you know about something, the more you realize what you don't know about it. Um, I don't normally do that. I'm going to drag this over here. So. Someone was excited that I was doing this without the kids. In. <laughs> I wouldn't get excited. Uh, it's a bit like this. I learned this at Bible college, so it's worth going. Uh, imagine this box is absolutely everything there is to know in the entire world. Knowledge, wisdom, everything. It's absolutely everything. And then uh, here's, uh, who should I pick on? Uh, no one. I looked at Nigel, but not deliberately. Here is Nigel's knowledge uh, of what he knows. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Here is, okay, fine. <laughs> now, this is his wisdom and knowledge. And if he learns more, that's uh, sorry, and outside of this is everything he doesn't know. But at the moment, he knows so little that what he actually knows about and what he doesn't know is very small as well. Now, if he learns more wisdom and knowledge, that's, I mean, that's an impressive growth. Good work. <laughs> this is now everything he knows, but what he's become aware of is even more that he hasn't got a clue about. So actually, the more wisdom and knowledge you grow, the more you don't know and you realize you don't know. You don't need to remember that. I was just... Uh, Thought I'd pass on everything I learned. <laughs> uh, but you can apply this to everything, can't you? Wisdom, knowledge, going to school. The more you learn about something, the more you realize what you don't know. Uh, and in a sense, so the more you learn about wisdom or knowledge, the more grief, the more sorrow you're aware of in our world. So wisdom and knowledge didn't find us meaning or satisfaction. The next thing that our teacher goes on to in Ecclesiastes is the idea of pleasure and comforts. Maybe there is meaning, something to be gained from pleasure and comforts. Have a look at uh, chapter two. Uh, chapter two, uh, Ecclesiastes may have been written by King Solomon, in which case this chapter is really an autobiography about him. Uh, others think that it was written by someone else, but he's, he's presenting this idea that even Solomon uh, would be thought like this. This is what he discovered. So we're not sure whether he wrote it or not, but the point is very clear. Have a look at verses four to nine. This is his pursuit to find satisfaction in pleasures and comforts. Verse four, I undertook great projects. I built houses for myself and I planted vineyards. I made gardens and parks and planted all kinds of fruit and trees in them. I made reservoirs to, to water groves of flourishing trees. I brought male and female slaves and had other slaves who were born in my house. I also owned more herds and flocks than anyone in Jerusalem before me. I amassed silver and gold for myself and the treasure of kings and provinces. I acquired male and female singers and a harem as well, the delights of a man's heart. I became greater by far than anyone in Jerusalem before me. In all, in all this, my wisdom stayed with me. I mean, he has gone to town on this experiment, hasn't he? Is the meaning and pleasure, is the satisfaction, sorry, in uh, pleasure and comfort? I mean, this is what we aspire to, doesn't it? Uh, this is why we live life sometimes. Certainly have why our world lives life. Uh, great estates and vineyards, generations of servants, entertainers, prostitutes, all done in the name of research, mind you, he says. I denied, verse 10, I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. This is today's message, isn't it, in our world? I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all my labours, and this was the reward of my toil. 
Uh, that is an interesting verse, that, that whole verse. I deny myself nothing my eyes desire, refuse my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all my labor, and this was the reward for all my toil. He took delight in all he had achieved, in his pleasures, and in, in, in the work that he had done. In other words, don't be naive. Ecclesiastes is real. There is pleasure and joy to be experienced in this world. Although, no, as of yet, he's not mentioned a thing about what God thinks of his exploits. But as a human, there is pleasure in pleasurable things. But, verse 11, yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, Everything was meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. In the moment, he, he enjoyed those things. But taking a step back, he fails to see how anything he has done or achieved has gained him anything of realness in his life. How has a pleasurable experience actually brought lasting joy or satisfaction or meaning? Uh, maybe think of as kids, you probably enjoyed uh, going to the theme park. Now it just makes you throw up. But that experience of pleasure and joy has achieved nothing really for us. We enjoyed it at the time, but it, it's like a chasing after the wind. It's gone. Uh, same with massive houses, lustful desires, great social lives. They all might bring something temporary, but satisfaction, lasting joy, something of worth or gain will be lacking. Uh, the Christian Amish communities, uh, mainly in North America, send their children out when they reach 18 for a year to enjoy the pleasures and delights of the world. Uh, so they leave their sort of simple and secluded homes and they're sent out for, for a year. If they find great joy and satisfaction in them, they can stay. But if they don't, they're welcome back into the community. Uh, the vast majority according to those I've met, uh, go back because they find nothing lasting in the world. I'm not suggesting that's a good practice, incidentally. Uh, we'll see later on from this passage that it's, it's perhaps not. But it's telling, isn't it, that, that pleasures offer no real satisfaction or joy in life. Uh, we do our, our children no favours, incidentally, also. If we raise them with pleasures and the rewards of this life as uh, their motivation, there must be a better way. There must be something of meaning. So knowledge, wisdom didn't work. Uh, the pursuit of pleasures and comforts didn't work. What about madness and folly? The, the other side of the coin from wisdom and knowledge, perhaps. Uh, verse 12. Uh, then I turn my thoughts to consider wisdom and also madness and folly. What more can the king's successor do? than what has already been done. Uh, in his pursuit, I think he's saying, of all his great pleasures, all his toil and hard work, he's, it, all of that has contained plenty of foolishness and madness, if you like, in his experiments. He knows what it's like to, to be foolish as well, to ju just do whatever he wants. Uh, he's prostitutes and slaves and great buildings, drinking. And as he reflects and he thinks even about foolishness, maybe there's meaning in just losing myself. Uh, he reflects, verse 13, I saw that wisdom is better than folly, just as light is better than darkness. Uh, so obviously, uh, wisdom, he concludes, is better than folly. But, verse 14, uh, the wise have eyes in their heads while the fool walks in the darkness. But I came to realize that the same fate overtakes than both. Uh, wisdom is better than folly, yes, but both end in the same fate. Death is going to knock on the door of the fool and the wise man. In a sense, both are meaningless. Verse 15, then I said to myself, the fate of the fool will overtake uh, me also. What then do I gain by being wise? What's the point? Uh, this too is meaningless. For the wise, like the fool, will not be long remembered. The days have already come when both have been forgotten. Like the fool, the wise too must die. 
Uh, what does seeking wisdom achieve? What does seeking pleasure and comforts achieve? What does seeking foolishness or, or disappearing into madness achieve? They all achieve the same thing, he says, death. Uh, sure, wisdom is better than folly. Uh, pleasures offer a temporary joy. But seeking any of these things in and of themselves for their own sake, for us, for our achievements, all achieve the same thing. They offer no light on the question of what is life all about? Uh, finally, uh, fourthly, he reflects on work and investments. Uh, I think this, uh, this work and toil section uh, towards the end of the passage links in with the rest of the passage. In other words, it's taken a lot of work and toil to achieve all his pleasures. It, it's kind of a, a work hard and play hard mentality. And in all of that, he finds no reason or meaning under the sun in this life. Uh, perhaps many of us feel that about our work or our pleasures or our relationships at times. And so verse 13, 17, he concludes about all his toil and his work. Uh, so I hated life. I hated life because the work that is done under the sun was grievous to me. All of it is meaningless, uh, chasing after the wind. Uh, verse 18, I hated all the things I had toiled for under the sun. Even the stuff he temporarily enjoyed, he, he begins to hate, because I must leave them to the one who comes after me. I'm not saying anything about her own children, but who knows whether that person be wise or foolish. Yet they will have control over all the fruit of my toil into which I have poured my effort and skill under the sun. This too is meaningless. Let's skip to verse 22, chapter 2. What do people get for all the toil and anxious striving with which they labor under the sun? All their days, their work is grief and pain. Even at night, their minds do not rest. Sound familiar? This too is meaningless. Uh, we work, don't we? And we strive, we store up, we seek pleasure. And at the end of the day, we die and someone else benefits from our sleepless nights and all our anxiety that we've struggled with throughout our lives. All that hard work and toil, which is best for someone else. I'm not sure there's another passage in the Bible that so accurately describes probably each of our experiences of life here today in Britain, at least. Anxiety, sleeplessness, work stress, pleasure that just pleases us for a minute and is gone. Living from one thing to the next, meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaning, meaningless. Everything is meaningless. Leaving an inheritance uh, may benefit the one after, but ultimately it's got nothing for us when we go. Our work, our investments for the future, it all seems meaningless. Uh, well, I said already that the common theme for all these experiments is this idea of toiling after. And he's toiled after all the, these things. Uh, in other words, he, he's looking for this meaning, for this reward, for this gift. What, what can he gain in this life that is worthy, uh, which is going to make a difference? He's toiled after pleasure. And he's toiled after wisdom. And he's toiled after knowledge. He's even toiled after being a fool and, and, and madness. He's not slept. He's being anxious. He, he's worked. He's done everything he can. But there is a subtle but golden verse in today's passage that makes a very important point. It, it makes a distinction between his toiling after and his toiling in. Have a look at verse 24 and 25. Verse 24. A person can do nothing better, sounds like a conclusion, nothing better than to eat and drink and find satisfaction in their own toil. This too, I see, is from the hand of God. For without him, who can eat or find enjoyment? Uh, reverse that a bit. With God, there is potential to find uh, enjoyment, to eat, to live this life. Do you see the difference between that verse and the rest? 
It's meaningless to pursue reward, gifts, joys from the fruits of our toil and work. That is why we're living, to get all the good stuff. But the best satisfaction we can find in this life, he says, is in the actual toil and work that God has given us. Uh, the kind of normal, everyday, routine nature of life. That is God's design for his created people. That is God's hand in our lives to work and serve him rather than striving after greatness that always leaves us lacking. In other words, we can enjoy and be satisfied in the very normal rhythms of life rather than the result of our work. Uh, the teacher sought satisfaction in great buildings and prostitutes and entertainment. They were found meaningless. Instead, he simply should have found satisfaction in his work, in what he was called to do before God. Uh, so we can grow in wisdom and knowledge. We can uh, strive to be more like Nigel. <laughs> it took a while. <laughs> But in our work, we are to be satisfied, not in what we achieve. It is God's design for us to work and to toil in this life. The very fact that there is no uh, meaningful gain or reward worth having on this earth gives us more reason to let go of all those things, that, that striving after greatness, and simply be satisfied, to be content, to be patient, with the life that God has given us. Uh, if you like, embracing our smallness, which is a theme throughout Ecclesiastes, as we'll see next week, embracing our smallness and our simple duty to work and subdue the earth as God commissioned humanity to do in Genesis. It's God's design for us, not to be the king and the queen, to be the greatest. We'll never seek, we'll, we'll never find joy in seeking greatness and wealth and pleasure. They'll all leave us wanting. We'll always be Mr. Burns. I'll give it all up for more. But how freeing to know that uh, instead we can enjoy the process of life, <coughs> to enjoy eating and drinking and working and toiling, for that is the calling of humanity. Uh, well, I hear you say, no, maybe not. How is that more meaningful? I mean, you make a good point, but how is that more meaningful? What, what does that achieve? Surely that's still not it. <clears throat> well, here lies the beauty of God's love and design for us. Have a look at verse 26. To the person who pleases him. In other words, the person who finds contentment in the life we're called to live and work at all, the normalness of life. God gives wisdom, knowledge, and happiness. But to the sinner... He gives the task of gathering and storing up wealth to hand it over to the one who pleases him. It sounds like his experiment, doesn't it? I've achieved all of this. Look at all the great things. I and then I die and pass it on to someone else. What is that person? According to this verse, well, they're the sinner. But to the person who pleases God, who seeks to be content and satisfied and patient in the work God has given us to do, God gives wisdom, knowledge, and happiness. That is an extraordinary verse. It, it literally reverses how our world thinks. The person who accepts the normalness of life, eating, drinking, toiling, they please God. That is our calling before him to live the life we've been given, not achieving greatness, but recognizing our smallness before him. And they are rewarded with wisdom, and knowledge and happiness. God gives us the gifts that our world so vainly strives after. It is a sinner who is tasked by God to go after all the things that this teacher has experimented with in this chapter, gathering up and storing up wealth, enjoying pleasures as the end game. But all they live for will be gone when they die. They have achieved nothing. Uh, the very thinking that earthly gain is what life is about, the, the very thing our world lives for, turns out both to be uh, meaningless 
and God's judgment on us. We are the sinner is tasked with the challenge of being great. God gives us that job if we want to be a sinner and we find no reward at all. But to simply live life, to, to value the normal experience of life, well, that means we're not seeking greatness or God's place, if you like. That's what makes you a sinner if you're striving to, to achieve things for yourself we can see how small and insignificant and temporary our life is before him. And so rather than elevating ourselves, we instead humble ourselves to live satisfied in the work, not our achievements, under him. It is why when we look around the world, we see Christians who can persevere under terrible persecution. It is why we can face the trials of life and still hold on to faith. It's why we can work with integrity and humility. Because we do not do it for earthly gain. We toil to please our God, who is our only gain and our only, only reward in this life and the next. We are walking and working uh, in, in a way that the watching world looks in and says, well, they're very small, but look how big their God is. We're a declaration that we do not need to strive after greatness. For we serve one who is all greatness. We find simple, patient, satisfaction and joy in the life we have been given. Because we gain an eternal inheritance in our death. What we gain and what we are given does not get handed on to the next generation, wise or foolish. It is ours forever. It is the Lord Jesus. When we humble ourselves. We accept who we are. We repent for being the sinners who have sought after being our own uh, gods, being great ourselves, and bow before him. <coughs> God is a, a gracious creator. And he himself, in all the glory of heaven, gave it all up. He came to earth as a man like you and me, and he didn't seek greatness. Notice that about Jesus' life. Instead, he chose service and humility. He chose death. He toiled at a very ordinary life, didn't he? He was a carpenter, and then he was a poor preacher who did the circuits. He made himself nothing. He died on a cross though completely innocent, so that our sin, so that our striving for greatness can be forgiven. Uh, I'm going to close uh, by saying a prayer. And I, I think reflecting on this passage, the, the response is to recognize our place, to give glory to God for how huge and great he is, for giving us the gift of normal life to pray that we'd be satisfied in that and please him in it all as an example to the world as we echo the life of jesus himself uh, if you don't know uh, the lord jesus uh, then this you can echo this prayer in your hearts uh, as an opportunity to repent before him and accept him as our great lord and king uh, and for those of us that do it's a great opportunity again to reset our lives and to live simply for him not for ourselves uh, i'm going to leave a, a moment of quiet uh, a minute or two and i'll pray
Lord Jesus, forgive me for my desire of grandeur and success in this life. Thank you for your grace in forgiving me for forgetting my place, my smallness before you. Change me again to live a life each day only to please you. To be satisfied with the normal life I have been given by you. To serve you alone as Jesus served us. Thank you that you love us enough to die in our place. So that when we die, this life has not been meaningless, but has the fullness of meaning, lasting for eternity, for you have died in our place. We praise you for our inheritance that awaits, and we give you all glory. <laughs> Thank you.